Hello and welcome to the Widow's Oil. Because I am speaking against um, the Hebrew Roots Movement and uh, speaking against Torah keeping, I've already found that the argument is used, oh, so you are saying we can lie, steal, kill and murder just as we please. So I want to speak about that and make this video so that in future I can just refer somebody who makes that argument to this video because I am not going to um, contend in that way and I'm going to explain to you why I will not contend about the word, the words. Um, firstly, I'm going to say to you that I am um, a South African. I've left the country. I was a young person under apartheid and I saw the fall of that system and I also lived under the ANC rule of Mandela. So I am well aware of the war of words that was waged against the um, European settler Christians and against the African people there. And in the end, both groups lost their land to the sly enemy who now rules over them. And that war was not so much waged with bullets, although that was part of it, and terrorism, but it was a war of words. And so if you come to me with your war of words, it's not going to work on me because I've seen through it. And it works the same in the attack against Christianity. Now, I am here as a fellow disciple of other Christians. And also, I feel I can be a word of comfort and an advocate for them, purely by the fact that the Lord Jesus Christ's spirit lives in me. I am nothing. But his spirit is in me, and so I can be stand up for them and speak for them. And so I want to say to you, if you come with your argument of, oh, so if, if you say we mustn't keep the Torah and we must only follow Jesus, then you are saying that we can uh, lie, kill, murder, do whatever. Um, I'm not going to fall for that because that is not a pattern of sound words. And, and in Christianity, we, we have received the scriptures and we have been taught a pattern of sound words. We have our own words. And if you are Christian, and um, even if you are in Hebrew roots and you are um, watching my videos and you don't agree with me, I want to show you that we are told to keep to a pattern of sound words and not fall into this wrangling of words, which is not going to work. It's unprofitable and it works to the advantage of the enemy who seeks to sow confusion and cause division and strife and thereby overthrow people's faith. So don't even try it with me because it's not going to work. Now I'm going to sh share my screen and I'm going to show you what the scripture says about keeping a sound pattern of words and why if I use the word keeping Torah, I'm, keeping, I'm using the term that Judaism itself uses and the Messianic Judaism movement and the Hebrew roots movement. It is not our word and I define it according to what it is used and what it is biblically. So let us have a look at that. If we look here at 2 Timothy 1 verse 13, Paul says to Timothy, hold fast the pattern of sound words which you have heard from me in faith and love which are in Jesus Christ. In Jesus Christ, there is no guile. There is no wrangling about word meanings because we have been given a pattern of words um, by the Bible, which we hold fast to. To encourage believers, hold fast to the pattern of words you have. Don't start to use other words like keeping Torah. 
when you mean to follow Jesus Christ. Um, don't change the words because it brings confusion and it gives um, opportunity for the enemy. Now, let us look here. What if I Google keeping Torah, what does it mean? Let us look there. It says, yeah, do Messianic Jews keep Torah? And then it says, with few exceptions, Messianic believers generally consider the written Torah, the five books of Moses, to remain in force as a continuing covenant. Now that means that they are under the old covenant. They are believing in Jesus, but they are under the old covenant. But Paul told us, if you are circumcised, Christ will not profit you anything. Now that just doesn't just mean physically circumcised. It means if you cling to the old covenant, then Jesus won't help you because you will be blind. You will be blinded by it. So it's clear there. Very clear, keeping Torah is means holding fast to the law of Moses, the old covenant. That is the meaning of keeping Torah. But now people are starting to use it when they, they mean to follow the commandments. Let us have a look here. How, what was the words Jesus gave us? Jesus says in John 14, he says, if you love me, you will obey my commandments. And he says it over and over. If you love me, you will keep my commandments. Jesus never said, if you love me, you will keep Torah. He never spoke that way. So that is the sound pattern of words we have received. So when I speak of keeping Torah, I mean according to the way that it's done in Judaism and in a lot of the um, Hebrew roots. They like this, Jesus came not to abolish the law, but to fulfill it. And then they confuse the Christians, but they, they focus on this. I didn't come to abolish the law. They ignore he came to fulfill it. The law, the first covenant law only passed in 70 AD when that whole system was destroyed and the sacrificial system was destroyed. And Jesus didn't come to abolish it so we can live lawlessly. He came to fulfill it so that we were given the Holy Spirit to obey him. You see, because he says here, if we keep his commandments, then he will ask the Father and give us another helper, the Holy Spirit, who will stay with us forever. He is the Spirit who reveals the truth. So the Holy Spirit will live in you and you will be able to keep the commandments. You, you will not want it to lie or steal or murder because the Holy Spirit will convict you on the spot. And you will feel awful and sad and you will run. You will immediately pray and beg for forgiveness and you will not continue in your sin because the Holy Spirit within you convicts of sin. So keeping Torah very clearly, if you Google it, look here, it says, should Gentile Christians keep Torah? Yeah, it's another unsound pattern of words. Do not call yourself a Gentile Christian. Christian, you are busy giving away your heritage to the enemy, Satan, if you do that. Because Paul wrote, there is now no longer Jew nor Gentile. You should not be speaking of Gentile Christians. You see, this war works with first your your first they take Satan will take your words and change their meaning, and you will start to speak like him, and then he will steal your inheritance. That's how it works in the physical way, and that is how it's going. This battle is 
happening spiritually. So don't call yourself a Gentile Christian. You can call yourself a Christian or you can for call yourself a disciple of Jesus Christ. And be also careful of exchanging the name Jesus for Yeshua. Be very, very careful because that Yeshua is not necessarily the Jesus we, we, uh, we have. It could be a Jesus that is going to lead you back to the first covenant. So absolutely a war of words. Should followers of Christ observe Torah? That means keeping the law. So that is the words of Judaism and Messianic Judaism and Hebrew roots. They use this. What does it mean to be Torah observant? And many, many Christians are following this. If we look at this one um, article, um, which I will make a separate video because it's very fascinating to, to go through this. I want to show you one point here that is uh, also not a pattern of sound words. The writer sp speaks here of what Torah observance means to her, and she explains it exactly in what I said, is that what it means for the Hebrew roots movement or for Judaism. Um, but yeah, we read this. We live in a Gentile pagan culture far removed from first century Jewish thought. Now, in the West, I can't speak for the East because I don't know it, but I speak for the West. It is not true that we live in a Gentile pagan culture. We live in a Christian culture that is apostatizing, a Christian culture that has been infiltrated by patterns of thought that are foreign to Christianity. That is what we are seeing. Now, if you look here in, tit uh, in Titus 3, it says, avoid foolish disputes, genealogies, contentions, and strivings about the law, for they are unprofitable and useless. There is no point in striving what is meant by using Torah and catching. And, and if you are Christian, don't let them catch you in that way. Don't let them say, oh, so you think we can. That is such a straw man argument. Oh, so you, when you say uh, we must uh, not follow the law, then it means we can be lawless. It's a straw man argument. They're setting you up so that you can strive for hours and hours and hours and get nowhere. So don't fall for that trap, people. Um, yeah, in Acts 18, we also read something very interesting, and I'm not going to read all that. Um, if you are interested, you can go and read Acts 18, verse 1 to um, 17. And it, it speaks of uh, certain Jews that rose up against Paul and brought him to the judgment seat of the proconsul and said, this fellow persuades me to worship God contrary to the law. And that's what I'm finding. If I say follow Jesus by faith, um, according to the gospel of grace, then I am accused like Paul is of saying I must be a worship God contrary to the law and be lawless. And then this proconsul, he actually said to them, he is not interested in the question of words and names of their own law. If Paul did something wrong or a wicked crime, then he would be interested and he would deal with it. But it's not such a question of that. It's a question of words and names and wrangling about the law. And that is what I find is that people who are clinging to law keeping, 
they come and they, they make you a criminal uh, about a word, about the way that they actually use the word. And, and it's not even the words that we use in Christianity. So, yeah, in Isaiah 29 is a very interesting chapter which I will read because it's very appropriate. But if you're not interested in hearing the whole uh, chapter 29, I want to just end off this video with reading this part um, of a certain type of person that is going to be cut off. Now, this was done when Jesus came and established Christianity and set a sound pattern of words. And I'm not saying the Christian church was perfect. Far from it, I don't even attend the church anymore. But the church, the body of Christ is a spiritual body. And I'm standing up for the body of Christ, whether they be within churches still or without, because some churches are holding fast to the truth, many are not. And then the Bible says, come out of her, my people. If you are in a false church, you must come out. But they are not all yet apostatized, not all have fallen away. So, the Lord promises in this chapter victory for his people who are in Christianity. It says there, And all who watch for iniquity are cut off, who make a man an offender by a word, and lay a snare for him who reproves in the gate, and turn aside the just by empty words. Just as if you say anything against Zionism, you are anti-Semite, or in South Africa, if you said anything against a terrible crime, you were a racist. In the same way, if you say that you shouldn't keep Torah, you are now made a lawless person. You see, so you are made a criminal by a word, and it's just empty words. Don't fall for it, Christian. Hold fast. So if you do not want to read with me this beautiful chapter, um, which is, was uh, applicable in the day of Isaiah, who foresaw that the Lord would uh, destroy the wickedness in which um, his people were but been kept in bondage. But those words are very applicable for what is going on in the Jerusalem below today, the physical Jerusalem. But if you do not want to read it, I greet you. Otherwise, you can join me and let us read this um, very appropriate chapter in Isaiah 29. Isaiah 29, New King James Version. Woe to Ariel, to Ariel, the city where David dwelt. And the footnote actually says, Ariel means lion of God. So the, the Jerusalem below, which now is, is the lion of God. It is certainly acting like a lion. It is tearing all around it. And it is all written for us um, to understand and to know that the, the battle is the Lord's. It says, woe to Ariel, to Ariel, the city where David dwelt. Not dwells, dwelt. Past tense. And year to year, let feasts come around Yet I will distress Ariel. There shall be heaviness and sorrow, and it shall be to me as Ariel. I will encamp against you all around. 
I will lay siege against you with a mound, and I will raise siege works against you. You shall be brought down. You shall speak out of the ground. Your speech shall be low out of the dust. Your voice shall be like a medium's out of the ground, and your speech shall whisper out of the dust. Now that's already fulfilled in them being what the Bible calls of the earth earthy. They are the first Adam who is of the earth earthy, and their doctrines are fleshly and carnal. And so they attack those who have seen the truth and and make them an enemy because they do not have the spirit to show them the truth of what is written in the New Testament. It says, Moreover, the multitude of your foes shall be like fine dust, and the multitude of the terrible ones like chaff that passes away. Yes, it shall be in an instant suddenly you will be punished by the Lord of hosts, with thunder and earthquake and great noise, with storm and tempest, and the flame of devouring fire, the multitudes, multitude of all the nations who fight against Ariel, even all who fight against her and her fortress and distress her, shall be as a dream of a night vision. It shall even be as when a hungry man dreams and look he eats but he awakes and his soul is still empty or as when a thirsty man dreams and look he drinks but he awakes and indeed, indeed he is faint and his soul still craves so the multitude of all the nations shall be who fight against Mount Zion and this is fulfilled in Judaism, Jesus said, He who drinks of the living water will never thirst or hunger. But if you remain under the old covenant, your soul is empty. It says, Pause and wonder, blind yourself and be blind. They are drunk, but not with wine. They stagger, but not with intoxicating drink. For the Lord has poured out on you the spirit of deep sleep and has closed your eyes, namely the prophets, and has covered your heads, namely the seers. The whole vision has become to you like the words of a book that is sealed, which men deliver to one who is literate, literate saying, Read this, please. And he says, I cannot, for it is sealed. Then the book is delivered to one who is illiterate, saying, read this, please. And he says, I am not literate or learned, as the King James Bible puts it. And that is what it says, is that the people cannot see. The, book, the Bible is sealed when you are clinging to the old covenant when you are you do not understand grace and you are not able to read and understand because you do not have the holy spirit to help you understand therefore the lord said inasmuch as these people draw near with their mouths and honor me with their lips but have removed their hearts far from me, and their fear toward me is taught by the commandment of men. Therefore, behold, I will again do a marvellous work among this people, a marvellous work and a wonder, for the wisdom of their wise men shall perish, and the understanding of their prudent men shall be hidden. Woe to those who seek deep to hide their counsel far from the Lord, and their works are in the dark. They say, who sees us and who knows us? Surely you have turned, you have things turned around. Shall the potter be esteemed as the clay? For shall the thing made say of him who made it, he did not make me? Or shall the thing formed say of him who formed it, he has no understanding? So 
there is a secret counsel against the people of God. And they there are those that, that think it is not seen, but it is clearly seen by the, those who have the Spirit of God to seek that, to see that deep hidden counsel against the, the faith. Is it not yet a little while till Lebanon shall be turned into a fruitful field and the fruitful field be esteemed as a forest? In that day the deaf shall hear the words of the book and the eyes of the blind shall see out of obscurity and out of darkness. The humble also shall increase their joy in the Lord and the poor among men shall rejoice in the Holy One of Israel. For the terrible one is brought to nothing the scornful one is consumed, and all who watch for iniquity are cut off, who make a man an offender by a word, and lay a snare for him who reproves in the gate, and turn aside the just by empty words. And Jesus accomplished this 2,000 years ago when he brought Christianity. And now there is a rebellion against it and this is going to happen again and Christianity will be there in, in uh, the Middle East. This, I believe, is a, um, a prophecy. Now, I am just your fellow disciples, so please hear me. I'm not saying it is so, but this is what I believe. The enemy has laid a snare and is hoping that those countries in the Middle East will belong to the enemy, but it is going to be Christian. It is going to be Christian. It says, in that day the deaf shall hear the words of the book. They don't hear it there yet. We can hear the words of the book because the Lord has unstopped our ears and opened our eyes in his incredible mercy. And the poor shall rejoice because the unlearned in the eyes of all the rabbis that have the many, many books, they look down upon the, the Christian, but the Christian who understands grace understands the book, and the learned and the wise men, their wisdom is destroyed. And one day, their wisdom will mean nothing. Just like Paul said, he counts it dung. He was a Pharisee, and he counted the Talmud dung. Now, the Talmud didn't exist in his day. It was orally. It now exists in written form. And then this description, which is so perfect, of how they come and make you an offender by a word and make you guilty as a collective and then say because your ancestors did something, you will be punished, all of you. But the Lord said, the son will not die for the sins of the father or the father for the sins of the son. Therefore, thus says the Lord who redeemed Abram, according to the house of Jacob. Jacob shall not now be ashamed, nor shall his face now grow pale. But when he sees his children, the work of my hands in his midst, they will hallow my name and hallow the Holy One of Jacob and fear the God of Israel. These also who erred in spirit will come to understanding and those who complained will learn doctrine. They come and complain when you speak against speaking, against Torah keeping. They come and complain, but they will learn sound doctrine. What does it mean when Jacob sees his children? Well, Jacob was so broken when Joseph was uh, in, in, taken away from him and his brothers cast him in Egypt. So just like when Jacob saw not only uh, Joseph, but Joseph's children, in the same way, the Jewish people will come to see the children of, uh, of God 
their brothers, the Christians, and they will see it is the work of God's hands um, and it's they are in their midst. They will come to see that we are their brothers and that we are the children of God and they will come to understanding. So this is such a beautiful chapter and so absolutely appropriate to our times and the enemy is hoping to overcome Christianity but Jesus said that the gates of hell will not prevail. Those that are within Judaism and within Hebrew roots that are trying to keep the law of Moses and Jesus, they will come out because the gates of hell will not keep them in. If Jesus is there, then there is hope for them to be um have the spirit poured on them and we need to just patiently endure for a little while. Do not let go, Christian. Hold fast to what you have. Do not let the enemy steal your crown and make your garment spotty with the fleshly doctrines that they have. We have a pattern of sound words um, the Roman Catholics always say we don't, if you, if you are not in the Orthodox Church or the Roman Catholic Church, you do not have your traditions, but we do, we have traditions, and they are written in the scriptures, and they are our pattern, and they are our inheritance, and we must not be like Esau, who despises our inheritance, and sell it for red sop because Esau was red. We must not sell it and go back to what was less glorious.